Okay, so this one is uh, for the ladies, really. Um, and uh, it is really women who are going to have to do uh, a lot of the heavy lifting in terms of uh, consigning feminism to that dustbin. Um, and I think we all probably agree why that needs to happen, um, but uh, maybe not everybody knows why women have to take a major role in that. Um, back in 1849, uh, during a temperance dinner, Susan B. Anthony uh, stated the obvious, and she said it was the obvious uh, to everyone. It was common knowledge. Women are the arbiters of social and moral norms in our society. By her reasoning, if women collectively made it known and clear that they would not associate publicly with men who had been drinking, most men would stop drinking. While her reasoning was a little simplistic, it didn't account for uh, the addictive nature of alcohol and other drugs, she and other female activists and women's organizations managed to do one better than convincing men to stop drinking. By 1910, these activists had convinced most state governments within the Union to be willing to amend the Constitution of the United States and prohibit alcohol altogether. The tactics of female temperance activists ran a gamut from Carrie Nation barging into saloons, yelling at all the men there and smashing the place up with a hatchet, uh, to putting on plays, going town to town and putting on plays uh, showing the ill effects of alcohol on women. Drunk men in these plays engaged in domestic violence and spent the family paycheck on alcohol, leaving their wives and their children destitute, starving, hungry in the streets, dressed in rags. A constitutional amendment is no mean feat in the U.S., and politics is usually downstream from culture. Uh, all of the groundwork the cultural groundwork to convince the population and politicians uh, that banning alcohol was a good idea. All of that was done long before women's suffrage, in about 50 years, in over the 50 years prior to women getting the vote. So that women were able to persuade an entire nation to consider such a thing in an era before the female vote existed, that's a testament to women's social and moral power and their effectiveness as props in um, morality plays. Of course, prohibition turned out to be one of the most disastrous uh, nationwide social experiments in U.S. history, um, contributing to the de development of organized crime in the U.S. and resulting in thousands of deaths and convictions, placing police and gangsters into a state of urban warfare in which innocent people often ended up as collateral damage. But all of this all of this disaster was informed by society's desire to protect and provide for women, its knee-jerk willingness to view men as dangerous and irresponsible, and its eagerness to listen to the complaints and demands of the fairer sex. During the suffragette era, many women active in community and charitable works rejected women's suffrage and fought hard to keep votes out of women's hands. For them, women's position elevated them above partisan politics. It facilitated uh, their, their exemption from the vote, facilitated their moral and social authority to secure the support of male politicians and community leaders for their works. How could they claim the moral high ground as women if their fingers were dirtied by insertion into the combat combative, contentious, degenerate pie of uh, partisan politics? In fact, in the US, it was only when suffragettes changed their tactics and convinced women that they needed to have the vote because no one else would be capable of bringing ethics and morality into the cheap, dirty realm of politics, if not women, that more women were convinced to support female suffrage and it finally passed. In 1902, a woman named Mary Harris Jones was broadly described as the most dangerous woman in America. What vile crime did she commit to earn this title? She organized striking miners in, uh, during an era when men who sought to unionize were routinely beaten and killed by privately hired police forces. She organized a children's march from Philadelphia to the home of President Theodore Roosevelt in protest, protest of lax labor laws. Her secret weapon, she recruited wives of miners and mothers of child laborers uh, to 
take up broomsticks, bang pots and pans, and shout, join the union. She felt women had a role to play in supporting men as a motivating force for men enduring hardship and danger from the establishment and as cultivators of public concern. A man denied a fair wage was a family denied a fair wage. A man denied safe working conditions was a family at risk of losing their primary means of support. Those were the tactics she employed. And while she used primarily young girls employed in silk mills as the public face of her crusade over child labor standards, the education and education rather than labor for children in the US, her advocacy eventually helped bring about sweeping reforms within industry in its treatment of all workers. Unlike the Trade Union League active in the US at the time, Mother Jones fought for all workers and she enlisted the help of women not just to serve themselves, but for the benefit of the men they loved and depended on. Known among supporters as the Miner's Angel, she was denounced on the floor of the US Senate as the grandmother of all agitators. In 1889 and 1890, a group of women in West Virginia uh, and Virginia and Kentucky, calling themselves the Daughters of Mother Jones, played a crucial role in presenting the case of exploited minors to the public and the press. Despite being imprisoned more than once on a variety of charges, from sedition to conspiracy to commit murder, uh, with sentences, initial sentences of up to 20 years, she generally only spent a few months in prison on any of these, uh, she spent relatively little time in custody, and particularly, uh, this is in interesting given the severity of the offenses she was uh, convicted of. Do you all see where I'm going here? At a time when male union organizers were being shot to death by private police forces and kneecapped by union busters, this one bulldog of a woman managed to get issues that directly affected men, women, and children, and families on the public agenda. She got politicians and corporatists corporatists like John D. Rockefeller Jr. to listen and implement reforms, uh, long sought reforms. And what was her message? Women's suffrage? Pfft, that's what she said to that. Uh, you, don't need uh, you don't need the vote to raise hell, she said. Her message was one where women have an obligation to the men in their lives, as noble and necessary as men's obligation to them. That men and women are on the same team, not in competition, and fighting the good fight together for the benefit of both and for the benefit of their children and their communities is the way it had to be done. She saw the roles of men and women in her, in her fight as not in conflict, but as complementary, and I guarantee you she had a solid understanding of women's power to create change and women's obligation to use that power not only for their own benefit. I get asked a lot uh, over the last nine years or so. Why, why do you do what you do? Um, even more so these days, since I've been speaking to uh, more virgin bums on virgin seats than ever before, uh, AM talk radio shows and, and uh, podcasts that don't deal with these issues. And there's really no single answer uh, to why I do what I do. I'm sure there are people out there who, when asked uh, why Karen Strawn does what she does, uh, they'll say uh, she has a son, she has sons and other men in her life and she cares about them. And while it's certainly true, um, that's not the whole the whole story uh, by a long shot. I'm not just a mama bear protecting her cubs. I could do that by advising my sons to go their own way, which I have. Um, give them the male equivalent of that conversation every parent has with their daughter um, regarding men who might want to take advantage of them. Um, you give a different talk to your son, but the point is the same, how to avoid getting hurt by the opposite sex. Um, and I could do, uh, and I do what I can to instill proper values in them, including those values that acknowledge their inherent value. If that were the only reason I wouldn't be here in London, why would I be? My sons will be fine. They won't be falling into any traps or pits specially designed to destroy men because they'll know them when they see them, and uh, they'll see them for what they are. And while I don't see myself as a modern day Mother Jones, uh, nor would I describe myself as her figurative daughter, I find myself in agreement with her approach to social and human rights issues. Uh, you can't help women by hurting men, and you can't help men by hurting women. We're stuck with each other, 
uh, we are fellow travelers on this journey through life, and if I'm going on a long road trip, I'd sure rather be stuck in the car with someone who sees me as a fellow traveler rather than an adversary or potential exploiter. Perhaps most troubling is that men have stepped up and supported women's causes for a long time now. Not just since the 1960s and 70s when male feminists like Warren Farrell took up the causes of equal pay and equal respect for women. In the UK, women's suffrage had support from the majority of MPs, all of them male, by 1910, for crying out loud. No one even asks men why. Why would you walk a mile in her shoes? Why would you pin a white ribbon on your lapel? Why would you take a pledge uh, in a, it, take pledges and run in a in a fun run to raise money and awareness for breast cancer? Why would you do that? Why? Nobody would ask a man those questions. Why would anyone ask a man why he would support an initiative to end partner violence against women, or why he would support an initiative to find a cure for breast cancer? We all know the answer. It's because men view these causes as worthy of their support and advocacy. Because men all have mothers, grandmothers, sisters, wives, daughters, and friends, female friends that they love. Girls and women in their lives they want to see safe and content and free. And yet when I go on some talk radio show for a 12-minute spot, almost invariably the first thing I am asked is, why do I do this? Why do you do this? How did I find myself advocating for men's rights and men's issues? This is just so strange. Why would a woman do it? And I almost always say something other than, why wouldn't I? Um, <laughs> even though that's really the proper answer. And to my mind, that's the saddest thing of all. That all of these men, mostly male radio show hosts, uh, who probably would put on four-inch heels and hobble their way around a public square or jogging track to walk a mile in her shoes to end domestic violence. Um, society understands why they do that, and they understand why they would do that, and yet society doesn't understand why I've laced up a pair of metaphorical steel-toed work boots and marched my clomping mile for the men and boys in my life. They need to ask. They just don't get it. And what these radio hosts are really telling me when they feel the need to ask is, uh, you're a woman. You're not really obligated. Uh, and that's what makes you special. I'm, I'm special? Am I the only woman? Or is, is there only a handful of us women on the planet who love our sons and our stepsons and our partners and our, even our ex-husbands? I love my father and grandfather and uncles and my male cousins and my nephews and my male friends every bit as much as I love my mother, my grandmother, my aunts and female cousins and nieces and female friends. Why would I not step up and say something when I see the men in my life and the boys in my life being discriminated against? The way men have done increasingly over the decades uh, when they see women in their lives suffering hardship, prejudice or injustice. My anti-feminism evolved hand in glove with my men's rights advocacy. There was really no other way things could go. The more I investigated feminism, uh, the further back I went, uh, the more I realized that not only was it a cause of some of the problems that men and boys face today, uh, things like poor male educational attainment or lack of due process in sexual assault and domestic violence accusations, but it stood squarely in the way of finding any solutions uh, to even those problems that it didn't cause. Things like male genital mutilation, military conscription, and the workplace death gap. More than this, feminism has planted itself squarely in between men and women at every level of interaction, from strangers on the street to husbands and wives, sowing seeds of female resentment and erasing the sacrifices and good deeds of men. Under its hegemony, we are mandated to acknowledge, as Sarah Hansen Young has been doing ad nauseum in Australian Parliament the last little while, all the ways male violence harms women and children and all the ways masculinity is to blame. But we are never allowed to point out the acts of heroism and sacrifice, such as those we witnessed just recently in Thailand, and acknowledge that there's something intrinsically masculine at work there too. Traditional masculine virtues have been de-sexed. 
to evoke those virtues and call them what they are, masculine, that is to insult, belittle, and demean women who, we are told, are every bit as capable of those traits and those deeds. Only in the ways men cause harm uh, do we still uh, label these things male, even when they're not significantly male in prevalence or in nature. That so many women have tolerated this state of affairs for so long is one of the saddest things I can imagine. That so many have embraced the prejudices and bigotry of feminism, that it is taught as a discipline in universities and strickling down into primary and secondary education, that's a testament to our complacency and our credulity, um, and not just of women, both men and women. And women are going to have to step up and really roll up our sleeves and help clean up this mess. And it's not because it's all our fault. It isn't. Not when the last president of the United States proudly posed for a photo in a this is what a feminist looks like t-shirt. Not when feminist organizations like the National Organization of Men Against Sexism exist. Not when people like the three Michaels, Mesner, Kimmel, and Flood, continue to preach a feminist analysis of masculinity in universities and in the media. This is not all women's fault. But con consigning feminism to the dustbin of history, that's a job for the ladies. Like Susan B. Anthony asserted in 1849 at that temperance dinner, women are in a unique position as the arbiters of moral and social norms. As the success of women's activists in the temperist and labor movements demonstrates, we are uniquely situated to harness the compassion of society to accomplish change in cu cultural attitudes and in institutions. And despite what certain female politicians would have you believe, <coughs> just Phillips, <clears throat> Even when we're not exempt from the harshest forms of pushback, we are almost invariably treated with more gentleness by trolls and angry listeners than men are when they put forth even the same arguments. And because feminism is an avatar of women claiming to represent our interests, men are uniquely helpless to fight against it. I would argue that they can't effectively destroy this toxic ideology because it is so easy to portray them as bullies and troglodytes, violent and malevolent and opposing feminism only out of a desire to harm women. Frankly, and frankly, finally, I think it's our responsibility. Society is ours too. We non-feminist women may not be responsible for making this mess, but we did sit back for a long time and just let it all roll along. And uh, I have children. I want all three of them, my daughter no less than my sons, to inherit a society capable of recognizing everyone's humanity and where men and women are no longer warring nations but are able to become the fellow travelers and team players they've always been meant to be. As Warren Farrell said once, uh, twice, probably a hundred times, when one gender wins, both genders lose. Men and women need each other. And we all saw a week ago, glued to our TV screens, watching as hundreds of men pulled together and put their lives on the line to pull 12 boys and their coach out of a flooded cave in Thailand. We also saw those men engaged in the work of heroism, not just the glory and the risk, the work of it. And because that work was necessary, that's why they did it well and also because it was best suited to them. But the work of reducing feminism to a fringe position, viewed with, I hope, one day, the same abhorrence by ordinary people as racism is right now, well, we non-feminist and anti-feminist women are gonna have to roll up our sleeves and get to work, because who else is gonna do it? Thank you. And nobody's allowed to ask, why do you do this? Um,
because I am so, so sick of that. Karen. Yes. Do, do you see any progress being made? I do, I do. The very fact that I'm getting in, you know, maybe two talk radio show interviews a day over the last three months, um, thanks to a, uh, a wonderful lawyer in, uh, in the U.S. Uh, who runs a group called the Men's Health Network. Uh, he asked if he could hire a publicist for me, and the publicist is getting me all kinds of uh, interviews and stuff on, on radio and podcasts. And I don't know that that would have happened um, you know, five years ago. Uh, I do think that part of the impetus for uh, particularly conservative talk radio in the U.S. for wanting to talk about stuff like this is that um, the Me Too thing has, uh, has really made an impact and it's got men really uh, nervous. And I think that essentially uh, that push is, uh, is something that they, f they feel now needs a pu to, to be pushed back against. And so that's helped me get my foot in the door. Most of the things that I talk about are uh, feminist uh, campaigners getting rid of, uh, you know, they got rid of the grid girls here. They want to get rid of NFL cheerleaders in the States. Um, they want to get rid of, um, uh, you know, all kinds of uh, sexualized uh, women, uh, you know, in, in media and all of that stuff. So essentially, uh, men are feeling encroached on finally, uh, down there, it encroached on enough to actually want to do something about it. And, and then I get my foot in the door and I introduce the more nuanced ideas and the other reasons why we need to actually look at feminism, see it for what it is and, and try to undermine it or get rid of it. So do you get good feedback from people sometimes? All the time, all the time. I, you know, like I, there are people who ask me, you know, you must, or they say, you know, you must get a lot of hate, a lot of hate mail, a lot of hate emails. I never have. I never have gotten a whole lot of that. Probably 99% of the feedback that I get, uh, whether it's in comments under my videos or whether it's in the emails and, and things like that is, uh, is positive. So, yeah. Um, choose, choose. Good day, Karen. Um, entertaining as always. Um, sorry, uh, I, I know I know how much you hate fluttery. I do. Um, uh, this this question might be a little sprawling because it's occurring to me on on the basis of what you've said. I think there's two sides to the coin. Yes, I think women have an obligation to maybe undermine it, but I think probably everyone in this room has faced what I find the most frustrating part of being an MRA, which is uh, the apathy of other men. Um, I, I, it just, it, it drives me nuts that these these issues that directly affect men that I interact with, they just don't take seriously or couldn't care about. Um, the one thing that you touched on was unionism. Um, and I'm just, it, it's just a kernel in my head that sort of occurred to me while you've been talking is there a place for male unionism? Because in terms of socio-economic movements that have actually achieved something, I think the union movements in most Western societies have actually got something done. Is that potentially a perspective we could move towards? Um, I think, honestly, that there, there's a, a role that women are going to need to play there too. Um, you know, one of the things... I use Mother Jones because she's such an iconic figure um, and because she very obviously used women... Uh, in ways that were able to get the sympathy of, of the public, um, but, and girls too. But uh, there, you know, like somebody once sent me a, a, a transcript of a whole, a bunch of transcripts of uh, he hearings um, from colliery accidents um, in, the, in the UK, in Britain, in the, you know, from about 1850 to 1885, something like that. And even there, uh, there was just this sense of apathy when, when you know, you'd have a jury that's being asked whether the, the mine is, is at fault, that the company is at fault for, you know, these 43 miners dying. Um, and uh, often in order to get sympathy from the juries, they would parade the widows and, and these orphan children in front of these juries and they would get them to testify and they would get them to weep and cry and all of these things and that was what was effective. Um, otherwise, uh, I remember in one, uh, the guy who was actually sort of prosecuting or he was arguing that 
uh, that the colliery was actually at fault for the accident. Um, he said that uh, the jury was signing off on, you know, no fault um, before testimony was even complete. There were still witnesses to testify, and uh, a witness was still testifying on the stand. And uh, and they're all signing, yeah, no, it's not. there's no fault here. And uh, so, honestly, you know, the power of women is, is I'm, I'm, I'm going to, I hate quoting Anita Sarkeesian, <laughs> but she really did, um, she really did hit on something when she said, in the game of patriarchy, women aren't the opposite team, they're the ball. And so, and, you know, the ball is really important, um, and men, uh, when you, you, you Women are used to call men to action all the time, right? And often they're uh, cynically used to call men to action. So I think that really the only way that, you're, that we're going to uh, be able to approach this is not as a male union, um, but as uh, essentially repairing the relationship between men and women and, and repairing families and you know, repairing society. Um, and it has to be seen as benefiting everybody. So, oh, I'm sure. I'm sure that when, when uh, you know, like the unions are about workers' rights, but in in order to actually make unionizing acceptable, the rhetoric around it had to be about families. It it really absolutely did. Um, you know, when a man dies in a, in a colliery accident, his wife is left with no means of support, you know. Um, and, uh, and if the company, often the companies were not compensating these women and, and, you know, they got very, very unpopular in their tactics um, because of that. Uh, you know, first this guy dies and now you're not even going to pay his widow? Like, what, what the hell's wrong with you? So essentially... You know, I, I do think that we need to take a more, perhaps a more cynical approach and use women in some of the ways that, that feminists use them. Um, and uh, because that, that's what is a call to action for men. And that's also uh, a way of essentially ensuring people that uh, getting rid of feminism or, you know, uh, fighting for the, the rights of men and boys isn't actually going to hurt women because people are not going to do it if that's what they think is going to happen, at least not en masse. So. Who? Who? I, I'm not picking because I don't, I don't like picking, so... Um, I, I, f I always feel bad for the people that I don't pick, so... Okay, um, hi, Karen. Um, can you think of any suggestions to help persuade more women to join the cause? Anything, uh, reasoned arguments or emotional arguments or any, th any other similar ways? Well, I think once it gets a little bit fashionable, and I mean, like, that's, that's happening too. We've got uh, the Liberty Bells, we've got Ladies for Philip, Philip Davies, we have uh, Women Against Feminism, we have uh, all, kinds of, all kinds of women from, you know, with all kinds of sort of um, perspectives, uh, traditionalist women, uh, more progressive women, uh, women who want genuine equality, uh, all kinds of women are sort of lining up, you know, according to their ideals and their goals and forming groups and becoming popular. And, you know, the, the internet has a great deal to do with that, um, being able to find each other. And w there is this weird thing about women is they, they don't want to be involved in something generally. Uh, to be involved in something that is considered unpopular or nerdy. You know, no feminist was interested in video games when it was like, you know, a bunch of bullied nerds in their basement, you know, uh, playing these goofy games um, and being nerds together. It was only when it became a multi-billion dollar industry that's bigger than Hollywood um, that, uh, that you saw feminists wanting a piece of that pie and wanting to control content there. So, you know, slowly but surely, uh, women are going to start making this more and more popular and, uh, and more women will join. That just seems to be the way women are in, in general, so. Yeah, thank, thanks, Karen. Um, 
I, I, I'm just curious, um, having uh, spoken to non-feminist uh, women and ordinary women, they, because they've benefited so much from the uh, huge advantages in the legal system in their favour, um, it's very difficult to convince them to give up the winner, the winner-takes-all system, to give up all the benefits of, of being the primary carer, to, to give up the benefits of hypergamy, for example. I mean, how on earth can you convince an ordinary woman, though it's fine, you know, look after the man, let him stay at home and look after the children, you go out to work. Um, and, you know, how on earth can we overcome this uh, huge female advantage in the system to encourage women to join us and say, no, no, we're, we're happy to give up 75% um, of the divorce settlement. You know, it's fine, no problem. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's a tough one. Um, you know, I think, I think that a lot of these women, uh, they wake up a little bit when it happens to their sons um, or their brother uh, or maybe their dad. Um, so as long as there's that kind of carnage going on, there are going to be women who've been affected by that. Um, through the men that they care about, and um, but yeah, no, I, I've often described non, you know, ordinary women um, as viewing uh, feminists the way uh, looters view a race riot. They're not there to riot about race or anything. They're not there to protest or or whatever. But they'll smash and grab, and you know, and uh, it's it's just it's it's great. It's an it's an advantage, right? You know, you just go in there and and take stuff. Um, so essentially, you know, that that is a tough one. And I think other women are going to have to do it, um, too, because, you know, like men arguing for these things, they particularly the alimony stuff. I think that enough women, you know, when you look at Florida and and places like that and you see that 80 percent of the public supports shared custody after divorce, that's not that 80 percent isn't only men. Um, so, you know, there, there are women out there who will support it and, uh, and there are women out there who are doing advocacy work for that. Diana Thompson, um, you know, uh, in the U S she, uh, runs an organization called women against paternity fraud. Um, and she does all kinds of lobbying at, you know, in Washington DC about uh, men's issues, including shared custody and stuff like that. Um, often shared custody bills are introduced to legislatures by women. Um, in Maryland, I believe, it, it was a female delegate who introduced the bill. So, um, you know, we are out there. Uh, it's just a matter of uh, convincing, I think, convincing other women that, you know, it's not really that scary to share custody of your kids with their dad. I mean, I, I, I never understood that mentality. I was just like, take them, take them, I'll pay you, right? I need a break. So, yeah. Um, uh, <clears throat> hi, Karen. Um, I'm, I like to think of myself as an eternal optimistic. Okay. So I'm going to put this out. Um, thanks to people like you and a lot of people in this room, I think in a probably less than 10 years, men's rights will be taken as seriously as women's rights. What do you think about that? Well, I think it's it's already starting, right? You know, like, it used to be, you know, 10 years ago, um, I would I would argue with feminists, and uh, they would deny all, outright the existence of uh, male domestic violence victims. They would deny outright uh, all kinds of things that um, you know uh, that women can that women can and uh, do sexually assault men, and that the prevalence is is not that different uh, in terms of numbers. Um, you know between men as sexually assaulting women and women sexually assaulting men. Um, they used to just flat out deny it, and now they're starting to have to admit to it. Um, they are starting to have to acknowledge that the numbers are not so different. Um, that even if they want to believe that um, that uh, female victims of it, partner violence vastly outnumber male ones, they're having a harder and harder time justifying the female monopoly on services. So essentially, that that's coming about. Things are changing, and the the less that they can just flat out deny, and the more they actually have to come into the conversation and defend their position or adjust their position, which is, has been happening slowly but surely. I wouldn't, I wouldn't say 10 years, though. 
um, you know, 10 years is like highly optimistic. I think uh, it might not even happen in my lifetime, particularly if I keep smoking as much as I do. So, um. it works. Oh, sorry. Um, you were talking about using women like the feminism does. So yeah. would it be like using the victimhood like they do? Um, no, no, I don't think so. I think, you know, like there is an, a, a, an aspect of uh, women being victimized by some of these things. You know, just talk to any second wife whose kids are wearing, you know, beat up sneakers because he, her husband is paying through the nose for, you know, his ex's kids ballet lessons and and private school so i mean like there are women who are genuinely uh hurt by some of this stuff um and girls as well um and one of the most interesting things uh that i've come across in uh, and the really horrible thing about this is like they stopped doing research i can't find any research after the 1990s on this Um, men who rape women, uh, they report uh, a, a, signific a significant portion of them, uh, just, uh, just above a majority, report being sexually abused uh, in childhood by a, an adult woman. Um, and the majority of them come from single mother uh, families. So when you're looking at those kinds of things, uh, the things that we're doing uh, wrong in terms of... Uh, ignoring female perpetration of sexual abuse and, and uh, subsidizing single mother families and things like that. Um, that's actually having an impact maybe 20, 30, 40 years down the road on other women. Um, so essentially, like, we do need to actually point out how feminism harms women too um, and how some of the things that we've done in terms of social experimentation, because I wouldn't say feminism is to blame for the welfare state in the United States and how that got started. Um, they certainly had a hand in it, but they weren't the only ones. Nobody wants to see women and children starving and homeless. Um, but at the time, nobody was willing to, uh, in the 1960s when all this started, nobody was willing to pay an able-bodied man to sit at home and do nothing. So the only way a woman could get a check for herself and her kids was to boot the man out or for him to leave on his own uh, willingly. So, you know, you, when you look at the whole picture, women aren't, they, they aren't doing very well either. They're less happy than they were in the 1970s, less content with their lives. They're stressed out. Um, consumption rates have gone way up. The more divorces you have, the more uh, single parent dwellings you have, the more resources you use. Um, 30 billion gallons of water in the U.S. could be saved if everybody stayed married a year. 30 billion gallons of water a year. So, you know, just because you're only having to have water in one household. So, yeah. We do need to use women possibly even cynically. Uh, yes, hello. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, in the Nordic countries, when you address issues of equality uh, and uh, issues uh, of feminism, the reaction from feminism Is, is often, oh, are you afraid that equality will go too far if you criticize or address something within the feminism? It might be the same in other parts of the world too. Uh, I think that's a strange thing to say when, when uh, if I address an issue that are you afraid that uh, equality will go too far. Uh, m my question, I don't know if it can be answered, it has maybe been addressed already, but what can we as men do in order not to always come one step behind feminism ideas and action uh, when we try to address it and balance it and, and correct it? What, what can we do instead to, to be proactive, to, to get uh, progress done without being perceived as criticizer, uh, criticizers of women and their issues and advancement? Well, it's very difficult for you to do it. That's why it's probably a job better suited to, uh, to women to actually do the convincing. Um, I do think that, you know, and I'm not, I'm not uh, crapping on all the progress that's actually been made mostly by men over the last, you know, 30 years or so in terms of these issues. 
Um, you know, men do uh, have a role to play in, advoca in advocating for themselves. Absolutely 100%. Um, it's just you have such a narrower path that you're allowed to walk in order to do this. I mean, I say, I sometimes say the most crazy ass shit. Um, you know, like I have said uh, in, in public that, you know, I, I would give up my vote, right? Like, I, I would do that. Um, if, if I thought that it was necessary to bring about proper uh, rebalancing of power in society, I'd happily do that. I know most women wouldn't, but I would. Um, I have said uh, on uh, to a uh, national news broadcaster's uh, journalist uh, one time that, uh, that the way women achieve suffrage uh, and the way they have achieved many of the gains early on, like the Tender Years Doctrine and, and the Married Women's Property Acts, uh, and how those uh, really did not take into account uh, both sides of, of the set of obligations and responsibilities under coverture, um, that, uh, that that was actually, uh, I, I think that that was a, a shitty way to go about it. I think that that needs, should have been done differently. And I have no um, admiration for the majority of feminists and suffragettes of that era. Um, I do think Sylvia Pankhurst was pretty cool. Um, but only because she abandoned that whole thing and then just went and did charitable work and, and stuff. But um, but essentially what you have is, is a situation where men, it's like Jordan Peterson said, uh, there's no way for men to control a crazy woman um, because you you have this barrier which you cannot cross as a man. And a crazy woman can be coming at you with, you know, violently and, uh, and you're still going to be perceived as the aggressor if you do something physical to stop her. So, and that's sort of the whole dynamic. Um, men are going to, they, they just have a tougher, tougher time with, with getting all of this stuff out there. But you should all keep doing it because. Hi, Karen. I'm. I'm Steven Svoboda. Um, mm -hmm. It's good to be here. And um, so I believe it or not, I'm getting married a week from tomorrow in California. I'm sure no one else here can say that. <laughs> and um, there, oh, thanks. There, there's a reason why I mentioned that, though, because my, my fiance and I talk a lot about these issues, as you can imagine. And she's never really considered herself a men's rights person. She never really thought about it till she met me, which was at uh, Showing of the Red Pill, by the way, the film that Cassie J made. And Cass Cassie's here. Um, so we met through that. She felt like I had to come to this conference a week before our wedding. And we, as I'm sitting here th listening to you talk, I'm thinking, the problem is that people like my fiance, we have to position ourselves in a position where there's really no rhetorical spot for us. We have to think independently and find a way to, to believe what we believe without any sort of name that we know of and t unless we come here for what we're doing. Whereas feminists, I think, have set things up where the default way to go is to be a feminist. And even if you're not really a feminist, you call yourself a feminist anyway like Christina Hoff Summers. That's such a problem. How do we fight against that, Karen? I mean, you've thought these things through so well. How do we fight the reigning paradigm? It's Well, you, you just have to chip away at it constantly. Um, you know, like it, the idea of, com a friend of mine once uh, said that the idea of compassion for men is like Teflon. Um, you, can, you, can, you can talk to somebody about it and they'll nod and they'll get it and then whoop, gone. Um, it just slips right off like a fried egg. Um, so it's it's just it's very very difficult it's it, like the problem that we face is that we don't have all kinds of old norms uh particularly uh ones that we uh are not just cultural but are also part of our instinctive uh you know framework uh we don't have any of those to exploit um 90 percent of what feminism has done has it has either done through exploiting men's desire to protect and provide for women, um, which is I I believe an inborn uh, desire. It's it's evolved, um, either exploiting that or um, convincing men that because that they don't love women enough, that they actually hate women. Um, that that. It's, you know, you have to have this massive outpouring of love for women. Uh, and the moment you put your foot down or say, no, tell, tell a woman no, uh, that means that you hate women. 
Um, I, I've never been able to figure out, other than them exploiting these, these sort of old ways of thinking, um, in, in inborn ways of thinking. Um, so we don't have any of those tools. Um, compassion for men has never been a thing. I mean, like it's been in terms of, like, think about the quintessential scene where the highwayman, pull, you know, is going to rob this guy, pulls over a, a coach and he's going to rob this guy and he puts the gun or the blunderbuss or whatever to his head. And what does the guy say? He says, please don't shoot. I have a wife and family. Right? Think of my family because I know you won't think of me. Um, so really that's that's what we're working with um and and it's extremely hard work and frankly i think it needs to be a discipline in universities just to figure out what the fuck has gone so how it's gotten so crazy and people can't see that you know we have we have this society festooned with initiatives to end violence against women end gender based violence against women uh you know help women support women uh look after their health all of these things seven federal departments in the US dedicated to women's health and well-being um you know and none for men and yet somehow when feminists say our society is misogynistic nobody laughs them out of the building like how how does that work um, so it's, we're fighting against our instincts here. Um, my presentation last year in Australia was all about all of the really sticky problems, the, 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 the instinctive problems, the social psychology at play, all of those things, because those are the things that are going to be really difficult um, to, we're going to have to find bypasses and workarounds, because I don't think there's any shaking it loose. So I don't know if, uh, one, one more question? I know, I know. It's not very hopeful listening to me. I'm probably Thank ki you. killing all the optimism it's in the room. It's Guten Grund from Norway. Oh. So we've come all the way to hear you uh, and the rest of the speakers. Um, thank you first for your brilliant uh, speech and uh, inspiring speech. But you left some very big questions in my head, and that was you said it's the women themselves who must take the fight against uh, feminism. Mm -hmm and the wrongdoings of feminism. It needs to be a cat fight. Yeah, yeah. which means we can't do anything. The men no, can't no, do you, anything. You have, to, you have to actually keep doing what you're doing and keep the pressure on. I mean, like, that's absolutely necessary too. But in terms of, if, you, if there were no women taking up this cause, mm. you guys would be so easily written off as as just a bunch of woman haters, a bunch of troglodytes, probably violent, definitely malevolent, and nobody should listen to you because you're dangerous. Mm -hmm. um, if there were no women involved in this at all, mm -hmm. so and so, women really need to make sure women in this movement need to make sure that we're visible, um, that that we're we're like a human shield for you guys um, in in some ways um, because they have to deal with us. Right. And uh, and dealing with us is not like dealing with you. They can just call you a misogynist and write you off and stop listening. But they actually have to contend with women who talk about these issues because we were not doing it out of self-interest. And because we do have a certain authority um, to to give people permission to think certain things um, that that's one of the things, particularly men, in fact, uh, women tend to give men moral authority to believe what they believe and say what they want to say in in many cases. Men often, if it's a little controversial, p particularly if it, if it involves women, they, they just aren't going to say it. So, so uh, the solution, I'm just testing you on, hmm. the, on the solution. Because if, if men can't do it, they can help along, you know. Oh, but you well, said that no it's, one, a, it's a woman who has to do, take the fight mainly. Uh, women and then you can say, perhaps women and men should start associations together and work together. Yes, you yes. Know. And then they can't call themselves a feminist movement or a masculine movement. But in Norway now, there is a, there is a page or a Facebook site called Equalist, you know, right. which is gathering both men and women, you know. Mm -hmm. But that's only a network, you know, not, a, not an association. Is anything of this happening in America or Canada where men and women go together, you know, on equal terms? and drop the word feminism and drop masculinism and go find a sort of common ground right. on some ideology there. Well, in Canada, we have a group called the Canadian Association for Equality. 
And they are not a men's rights organization. They are not an anti-feminist organization. But they are very, uh, they do a lot of good work, um, including inviting me to speak over and over again. Um, but uh, they, they essentially... Um, they have a focus right now, a stated focus on the issues of men and boys, because they believe those issues are being underserved at the current time by organizations and advocacy groups and by the system. Um, I think that honestly, if it came right down to it and they gained enough ground that they, you know, didn't have to have that focus, they would certainly open their, their focus a little bit wider onto other issues that didn't involve men and boys or that were not predominantly involving men and boys so um so there is that uh and they also um they work with feminist organizations uh they've invited feminist speakers uh, and feminist panelists and they actually network with feminist organizations to get services um for men who maybe are victims of partner violence uh, so essentially what you have is is this sort of hybrid organization like you're talking about where um, maybe the focus right now is on men and boys, but it's definitely got lots of women involved and, and they're, they're doing good work and, and they're trying to be very equalist about things. So, yeah. I don't know about the states, though. Is there, is there any more time for a question? Anybody else have? Okay, yeah. Okay, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, um, my name is Mike. Uh, I, this question is about socialization of, of boys and girls when mm -hmm. they're quite young. I, I was reflecting on the fact that I had devalued my own feelings and that the, the, the women who've beaten me up, if you like, have also devalued my feelings. And, uh, and was reflecting on the fact that um, observations show that even by the age of seven, boys don't even know the words for their feelings. Um, and girls are much more sensitive to their feelings. And uh, then I was sort of reflecting on the, the socialization that I received in terms of the colors I'm allowed to wear and mm -hmm. the textures and, uh, and all that. I wonder whether you've done any work at all, because it seems to me that the healing needs to start uh, you know, almost at the age of two, and, and that, that most of this caring is done by women. Mm -hmm. um, and therefore, if you like, the way men are when they're grown up is it partly as a result of the socialization they received when they were small? I do, I do believe that socialization definitely plays a role. I think that you're never gonna, you're never gonna get rid of uh, sort of the um, majority of boys gravitating towards trucks and the majority of girls gravitating towards dolls and things like that, and you know flowers and things that are pretty and playing house and playing tea party uh, rather than you know playing war. Um, and cops and robbers, I think that you're still going to have a, a fair degree of difference between boys and girls in, in those terms. Um, I, I think, you know, honestly, for boys right now, uh, when you were young, probably, it was very, very different. Um, when you were young, you were probably taught boys don't cry, um, you know, you got to suck it up and don't show your feelings and, and all of those things. But nowadays, boys are kind of being pushed in, in the other direction, and masculine tendencies, masculine forms of play are all but banned in schoolyards in, in the U.S. and Canada. Um, so you're, you're essentially saying, you know, they're not, some places that don't even let you play tag because it encourages aggression, and, you know, you're chasing someone, and that, that's not cool, and, and it people can get hurt feelings and and feel left out and you know when you get you get tagged and you're it and you know people feel singled out and it hurts their feelings and um so i think we're we're taking it too far in the other direction now and we're not allowing boys to be as masculine as they maybe want to be um but definitely um socialization does play a role in all of this um and single mothers sorry single mothers seem to be uh, you know, predominantly responsible for raising uh, boys into men who are hypermasculine. The the very men feminists don't want uh, in our society are seem to be the ones raised by single mothers, um, and uh, more involved in gangs, crime, drug abuse. Uh, you know, all kinds of nasty stuff. Um, and uh, I think it was Quinn Norton. Um, she's sort of. Uh, hacker culture's answer to Anita Sarkeesian. 
Um, she once said, you know, the problem is that men are raised to hate women, to hate us. And I'm thinking, who the fuck is raising these men? Right? And maybe, maybe you should have been a better mother if you managed to, you know, your boy, your son didn't learn love and respect for women at your breast, at your knee, you know, being soothed when he's crying. Um, while you watch over him in his crib, he's not, he's not learning any of that? Well, maybe he needs a better teacher than you. Because, like, honestly, um, it makes no sense whatsoever. So, um, I think, are we done? Okay, that's it. That's it for me on that note. Um,